Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I'm doing okay. How are you? Pretty good. Good, good. I got my car back today. Oh, yeah. yeah. You lost your car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we probably, it would have been more convenient to record last night, but, oh, uh, well, if the yeah. day had played out normally. <laughs> if you had had a regular day, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I lost a lot of time in the middle of the day because my I had to get my car towed. Yeah. And Over a battery. Yeah, that's what it turned out to be, but that's not what I thought it was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, and I couldn't get it to go anywhere. <laughs> that was the problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dude, there's nothing worse than being stranded. Yeah. Um, I went through the same problem you you went through, except mm-hmm. um, I went on and got my battery changed because I was like, I bet this is the battery and changed it. Mm-hmm. But um, like a couple of times when I went to crank it, it did the slow crank, or I had to push the button multiple because it's got. To, I hate to push the start, but that's what my yeah. car has. And um, I go to push the button, it wouldn't start. I push the button, it wouldn't start. And then like the third time, it'd start. Um, but that's a bad feeling. Like yeah. when you go I hadn't to, had that experience, actually. Yeah. I had only ever had to press the button one time until yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I had a little bit of a slow crank. Like it wouldn't immediately turn over when I'd press the button. Yeah. But then it seemed fine. And it yeah. always started just with one button push. Yeah. And, well, and mine had been doing the slow crank for probably a year. Um, and at one point I was like, oh, I should probably go on and replace that battery. I bet that's what it is. Mm-hmm. But then I never did it until I started having to do multiple pushes. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, this is getting real. <laughs> Mine had done the slow crank so long that I didn't remember it ever not doing the slow crank. <laughs> you thought that's just the way it cranks? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's all I thought. Luckily, I, I wasn't really stranded. It happened at my boss's office. So yeah. um, I actually got a ride back to my office and then a ride back over there to meet the tow truck and yeah. then home. And yeah. I've been home ever since pretty much, <laughs> except for when I went to pick it up today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, at least you got it back. Yeah. Back I on did the road not again. think that I was going to have it before. I thought I was going to be carless this weekend. That oh, sucks. Wow. Yeah. There's nothing worse than being, than either having a car that you can't get on and depend on, mm-hmm. which is, I've been there too, where the car runs, but like it might get you there and back. It might not. Mm-hmm. Um, that sucks. And then not having a car at all. Like that's the worst. Like yeah. <laughs> when I was talking to the mechanic today, he's saying, um, yeah, I always think, uh, when I, when I car have my car hits about 50,000 miles, I'm like, man, I got to start thinking about what I'm going to get next. And then he says, I always try and get get rid of it because uh, before 70,000 miles, because that's where trade-in values flip over a lot. Yeah. And I, I was <laughs> like, man, I drive them till they die. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I, I drive How many them miles does your car have on that? 310,000. Nice. If I can get another 20, 30,000 miles out of it, I'll be thrilled. <laughs> no, I hear you. Uh, I, I like one, that car. That have, car has been a good car. I mean, I it's a BMW, so it's expensive, but... I mean, considering the age and the number of miles on it, it hasn't really been a lot of trouble. Yeah, yeah. Well, it feels like it sometimes because every time it is trouble, it's expensive. It's not cheap. Yeah, <laughs> but that's the problem with yeah. those type of cars. Yeah, so. but this is my fifth, fourth, or fifth BMW. Yeah. The first one I had um, died at three hundred and thirty something thousand miles. Yeah. Um, and then I actually did get rid of one like well before it was time, but it had yeah. problems and I, I knew it had problems. It had a, um, had a transmission issue Yeah. and, uh, I made it very clear to the guy I sold it to that it had a transmission issue. And he's like, no, I got a guy. I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah, this is your problem now. <laughs> um, the one that I really miss is the 318. I had a 318 TI. Um, Which and one they, was that? It was the little hatchback. Oh, the hatchback one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it was, uh, they only made them for two years. I, I got a cat visitor. Um, they only made them for two years, and it's the same engine at the time that the Audi A4s were using. It was that 1.8 liter turbo injected four cylinder. Yeah. I loved that car. And I, I got like 28 miles to the gallon driving in the Atlanta. Yeah. And um and like 36 or 37 on the interstate in that car. And yeah. it had a lot of power and it drove so nice. I mean it drove like a BMW and yeah. I I really loved that car. Um 
And I'm not sure, like that one had close to 200,000 miles on it when I, when I sold it. Yeah. And I thought that was the first car I was like, I'm going to get rid of this while it still has value. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, I tend to be with you. I drive them till they die. Yeah. Like I say, I've, I've, I mean, I've traded a few cars and made a little bit, but mm -hmm. like I say, for the most part, like, because I get comfortable, like, yeah. like I buy a car that I like a lot mm -hmm. and then I don't want to get rid of it because I like it a lot. Like, yeah. I'm particular about a car when I'm shopping, but once I have what I want, I keep it. And now seems like such a bad time to try and buy a used car. It's, it's. I don't know that there's going to be a better time, but, well, it do, but it does, you're right though. It does seem like a bad time. Mm -hmm. uh, who becomes president could matter. Yeah. Well, it's going to matter. I mean, in terms of value car, of car values. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It's going to matter as far as a lot of things. Okay. <laughs> Freya, you either need to settle in and stop moving or go away. <laughs> I mean, it could matter as far as if we have food or not. It could. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying Kamala Harris would be able to get a lot of her policies through, but like we discussed on the last podcast, like it's definitely in question. Yes. Well, uh, uh, there was a debate. Is that what you call those things? Not really. <laughs> I mean, that's what everybody keeps calling it, but I watched it and yeah. it didn't seem much like a debate. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of a exchange of ideas as far as I'm concerned. It. It made me think of um, the like a collection of speeches from teenagers running for student government. <laughs> right. I can see that. Um, that that's mostly <laughs> what I thought. I was honestly don't have a lot to say about the substance because there wasn't much there substance. There really wasn't any. Yeah. Um, there was a there were some things that were worth talking about. I think, but yeah. it was. Um, but they weren't very substantive. <laughs> No, no, not. I mean, there was substance in the sense of, well, you know, both of them are trying to prove to everybody which one of them loves Israel more and, yeah. you know, things like that. They didn't, I, I really thought it was rich when uh, Kamala Harris said, well, this debate needs to focus on the policies that, we, that we're going to enact, the issues and the policies and what we plan to do. Yeah. Well, okay, go ahead. You first. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, <laughs> like, because when she gave her, op I guess she gave the first opening statement, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because Trump gave the the closing. Uh -huh. um, yeah, man, like it was just, like I was astonished by how just, there's just nothing empty there. Empty it was. It's yeah. just empty. It's, it's a bunch of, it's word salad. Like, um, But I will say this. I mean, I don't know your takeaway from it, but I like I feel like she got out of it alive. Um, I don't know if I'd go as far as to say she won it, but she definitely, she did better than I would have thought she did. Mm -hmm. Like she didn't come off looking like the complete idiot that she is. So. Yeah. I, um, it's hard to put yourself in the place of the kind of person who is taking cues from a debate about who to vote for. Yeah. Um, I think that that's, that's mostly, I think that those kinds of events are aimed at the low information voter. 100, for sure on that one. Uh, because anybody who's keeping up is like, both of these people are completely full of shit. Yeah, exactly. Sorry for the cursing. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I can't think of a better way of explaining, like neither one of them knows what they're talking about. Um, and they both lied throughout. Now that's something that's worth talking about though, because the, uh, moderation only corrected Trump. Exactly. Um, I, and in fact, the, the bias in moderation was, I, I would like to think that even the low information average voter that would be watching it picked up on that but i don't know yeah. and and a whole lot of who won kind of depends on that sort of thing yeah. so um the way they formulated the questions to the two was very very different yep. uh so they were um the moderators were uh argumentative towards trump not only in their um cherry picked fact checking yeah. Uh, but also in the way that they asked the questions. Yeah. Some of the phrasing and um, a few of them was like, is that really the best? You, is that how you're going to ask that? Like, mm -hmm. 
I thought. I don't know. So in a lot of cases, now the the girl moderator, I can't remember her name, she didn't actually talk that much, but it definitely felt a lot of times like Trump was debating both Harris and uh, Dave Weir. Is that? I think so, who yeah. Who that other guy was? Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I don't have, I don't think, I think they should have done the same thing that they did last time, which is not bother fact checking on the fly. Yeah. Um, because it makes it too easy for the moderator's own political biases to enter in. Oh, yeah. And, and I thought that it was very clear in that one, but then they would ask questions in a very combative way, um, to Trump and then ask Kamala Harris. And what do you think? Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, people, uh, president Trump, uh, people think that your economic plan is complete idiocy and um, that you're just going to crash all of America and destroy us all. Um, so how do you defend that? Okay, Kamala, what do you think of that? Yeah, right. <laughs> That's kind of the way the questions were asked. And I don't know. It was, it could play to him. If people recognize how biased it was, it could play in his favor though. Oh yeah. Like, oh man, they're really going after this guy. I mean, and that's always been part of Trump anyway, is that the the media and the apparatus go at him hard. And mm-hmm. the everyday people kind of see that and it's like, oh, well, like, I mean, it, it, you can't deny that the bias is there, you know, whether you agree with him or not. Yeah. Um, there was also, I, I noticed a big difference. I think that they only called uh, Kamala out for um, how long she was taking answering a question one time. And they yeah. kept cutting Trump off. We need to move on. That That's enough, President Trump. We need to move on. Oh, yeah. Um, now, it could actually be that he just Yeah, I wasn't sitting there with a the timer. Longer. So I don't, and I did think it was interesting that they didn't have one on the screen, or at least on the channel mm-hmm. I watched. I mean, maybe there was a station that did that. Because yeah. actually, I thought that would have been kind of helpful if they had had the timer on the screen somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I did. I only looked at one uh, question set to uh, Kamala and she definitely went over two minutes and they never said anything. I mean, she went over by like 20 seconds or something like that. And they never said, well, you need to wrap it up or we need to move on to the next question or anything like that. Um, they did stop her one time. She, uh, (coughs) the level of evasion on her part was kind of unreal. (laughs) And that's another place where there was some bias. So they would ask Trump a direct question. If it, if he didn't answer the question, yeah. Then they would say, but yeah. President Trump, we would like to know this is what we were asking. But they never did that with Kamala. Yeah. And and actually, I'm going to play. I want to play a clip right here. This was my my absolute favorite. Kamala not answering the question right. uh, moment. Um, so let's play this clip. All right. President Harris, have you ever met Vladimir Putin? Can you clarify tonight? Uh, yet again, I said it at the beginning of this debate, you're going to hear a bunch of lies coming from this fellow. And that is another one. When I went to meet with President Zelensky, I've now met with him over five times. Maybe she doesn't know the difference between Putin and Zelensky. <laughs> Maybe she thinks he runs Russia, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, you remember when they were accusing Trump of that, when he made that that mistake a while back? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I don't think that was a mistake. I think that's just her not answering the question. Yeah, answering was... a question that she wants to answer instead of a question. And, and in such a way that if you're not paying attention, and all it. these names are just like a bunch of Greek tea anyway, yeah. then... It, okay. Oh, uh, he says that she didn't meet him, and she says she met him five times. No, she said she met somebody else yeah, five that was, times. That was Zelensky. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, so and which, and they didn't call her out. No. Which I don't understand. Like I asked you a very direct question. Here's your chance to clear this up, and what you did was completely avoid the question, answer a, di- a different question. Yeah. And then the moderator's not going to say anything about that. Okay, and, and <laughs> you to, answer whatever you want to answer. Just say, just say words <laughs> up here, like it's fine. But mm-hmm. what does irritate me about that is that it, it is true that she has obviously she hasn't talked to him at all, or Putin at all, mm-hmm. and neither has Biden. There, they we don't communicate with the other side here, mm-hmm. and that's that's something that's this is a real problem. Biden has talked to Putin. Has he? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
At, at, the, but uh, what, what they're at a the, summit or something? Yeah. Um, the yes. Uh, the accusation, however, is that Kamala and Putin have never met because yeah. Trump's case is that she can't deal with him. Yeah. That yeah. there's no way she'd be able to handle Putin. Yeah. I think that he's right about that. I don't. I don't think any either of them can handle Putin though. No. Yeah. Well, Putin, um, he's just much smarter than either. Putin's of Putin's playing on a different level than <laughs> anybody we've got in the contest right now. Yeah. Um. But another accusation she had made to him is that you're just, um, you think all these guys are your friends and you're all chummy with them and blah, blah, mm. blah. And Trump really should have turned around. It's like, well, at least I speak to these people. And at least I have a, I have a dialogue with them because that's a big part of the reason we're on the verge of World War III here is because we don't have a dialogue with these other countries. Yeah, the, the most, to me, the most vexatious <laughs> part of the um, debate was when they were talking about Ukraine. Yeah. And... I I thought, man, here we have just two absolute fools talking about this foreign policy yeah. issue. And I thought, there's something terribly wrong here that I know more about policy, history, and geopolitics than either one of these people, one of whom is going to be the president of this country. They One of them will be, yeah. <laughs> and the reason is because I read. Yeah. <laughs> it's not hard. Right. I yeah. mean, like, they could know more than me. They should know well, more than anybody me. Anybody running for that position should know more, at least more than your average person. And and I really do feel like in both of their cases, I mean, they have probably about the same knowledge as your man on the street. Yeah. You know? And it, it's, if that. If if that. Mm-hmm. And it's shocking to me that, that that's that's what we're we have here. Yeah. Um, they, uh, <laughs> I mean, both of them were completely wrong. Trump at least was making the case that the war needs to end. Yeah. Like we need to bring an end to this war. We need to bring an end to it. There's all these people dying, yeah. all this destruction. We need to bring an end to the war. Um, and Kamala says, well, he would just end it by just giving up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, before I address that part, like both of them are wrong about the causes here completely. <laughs> um, Trump is wrong that Putin started the war because Biden and Harris are too weak. No. Actually, it's because they refused to negotiate with him in the first place yep. that this war started. Yeah. That they kept pushing the imperial agenda, the hegemonic American agenda, rather than take his security concern seriously and yeah. since they wouldn't deal with him because they yeah. had to be the tough guy yeah since they wouldn't deal with him he felt like he had no choice i think that he there are other routes that could have been taken but he felt yeah. like he had no choice and, and started this war or you know committed to the invasion and then she's making the claim that putin invaded uh ukraine because donald trump held up arms sales to ukraine which you remember he was impeached for. He was for. impeached for, yeah, for holding up arm cells that he eventually gave. Yeah. That's <laughs> point number one is that actually Ukraine got those weapons. Exactly. And two, that's probably a big part of the antagonism that led to the war in the first place. Yeah. Um, is that we were punch- pumping a bunch of weapons into Ukraine to fight against Russia. And so Russia was like, well, do we let them keep arming themselves or yeah. do we go ahead and step in now? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, like how bad do we need to let this get before we take some kind of action? Yeah. If you're standing in front of a guy and he's winding up to punch you, do you wait until he's actually throwing the punch before you do anything about it? Yeah. And, and it, all you have to do is think in terms of if Russia was putting arms and stuff and just military gear in Mexico, how long would we let that go? I think Canada is a better example. Okay. Canada. Yeah. I mean, either I'm, I'm way more concerned about you're Canada way more concerned with Canada. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Like how long will we let Russia load Canada with, with weapons and mm-hmm. military gear before we're like, Hey, you can't do this anymore. Yeah. You know, enough's enough. That's our biggest border. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, yeah, exactly. Um, so there, the idea that, I don't know, the problem here is, um, do you want to, what else do you have to say about the debate? Um, I mean, 
Because yeah. this is actually a convenient point to switch topics, but I, I think that there's a little bit more to say about the debate. So yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have a whole lot more to say about. It. I mean, it was um, it just it wasn't like I said earlier. It just it wasn't very substantive to me, and mm. it, not that I expected it to be. I didn't go in thinking I was going to get this large education. Like obviously, yeah. I knew what I was walking into. But um, but overall, I think Kamala Harris did what she needed to do. She didn't come off as as the idiot that she is, and mm -hmm. and that's a win for her. Yeah. Um, and the fact that they're probably not going to have another one of these means that she can probably just coast into the election mm -hmm. um, without really being exposed. She certainly seemed more put together than he she did. did. Yeah. Um, she came off as the the more reasonable person generally. Um, mm -hmm through the debate. I, and there was one like really terrible moment for Trump, um, where they were asking about his plan to replace Obamacare. Oh yeah, that was bad. And he was like, well, uh, you know, I'm not president right now. It's like, so why would I bother formulating a plan to replace this thing <laughs> that I think needs to be replaced since I'm not actually, since I don't actually have the job yet? Well, and it would have been so easy for him to have, have gave some kind of, I mean, the, the d Republicans do have a plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have a, a solid plan, but I mean, their talking point is, you know, mm -hmm. um, letting, like making prices open and letting people buy across state lines. Yeah. Like all he had to really do was like rattle a bunch of that stuff off. Mm -hmm. He should have been prepared for that. Yeah. He should have. And, and I, I I do think that he was actually just caught flat footed. Like mm -hmm. he didn't he didn't have a talking point prepared for that mm -hmm. and was just kind of caught off guard. Which is ridiculous because he has talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was it was <laughs> it was strange to me that he didn't I, I don't know what the calculation was there, but, um, but I it was, came off bad. Yeah, I was kind of amazed at some of the um the Harris claims that have been debunked for so long, like the very fine people. The, well, that, that one particularly irritated. And and I actually, when she said that, because I have already having had the moderators jump in, mm -hmm. I actually thought that the moderators might actually jump in and correct that. Yeah. Um, which obviously they didn't. Um, and I mm -hmm. guess I should know better, but it's, it's so egregious that I really thought that they may actually jump in and take care of that one. Yeah. There were a few of those moments. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, the talk about um, insulting the um, veterans and all yeah. that stuff, you know, like there's never been any, it's all hearsay. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, he said in some other, he also said something different. Well, you know, I thought it's like Trump had even, a good comeback for that <clears throat> with the, you know, everybody gets to write a book and that, that I fire. And you're like, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I actually thought that was, I mean, I think there's a lot of truth to that, honestly. <laughs> um, he, he had a moment and this is again, this is why I keep saying it, it kind of depends on how people, the average person perceives this. And I have a hard time putting myself in that place. Yeah. Um, there was the moment where he says, uh, where she starts to interrupt him and he says, I'm talking. I'm talking yeah. right now. Does that sound familiar? And that made me I laugh. I rolled, yeah. dude. <laughs> that absolutely <laughs> made me laugh. Yeah. Um, but I thought, to the average person watching, it just kind of sounds snarky. That. Yeah, they don't remember that. Like, yeah. I, I, I would be surprised. It's just if, rude. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I thought it was really funny, too. <laughs> and he had a few moments like that. The one mm. that I keep hearing, and of course, I know you know where I'm going, um, That, but I laugh. Every time I hear it is when he starts talking about they're eating the dogs and cats. Mm. <laughs> like they're playing that clip all over the place. And I'm sorry. I laugh every time I hear it. It's it, if it's going on, it's not funny. But the way he says it is just it gets me. Every yeah. Time. Well, it, they're playing it most places to make to make him look bad, to make him sound unhinged, which he they does. Do. He does sound that way. Um, but, but I don't know that that's going to play out for them the way they it's think. not because <laughs> they're while it's probably being a little overstated. There's evidence like this. Yeah. Well, he, he overstated it. He was kind of hyperbolic. Yeah. Um, but there, there do seem to be credible reports of like stray animals being eaten and yes. like, um, <laughs> you know, park animals well, being eaten and, and things and the, like that. The so. Haitians in Springfield, Ohio is a problem. Yeah. Um, like I've seen plenty of reports and stuff about what's going Like, I mean, I don't know. I'm not there, but it sounds like there's a real problem in Springfield. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just saying in the, um, like it's not unheard of for Haitians. I mean, I guess they practice voodoo. 
Yeah, I don't think it's about voodoo. But I don't think it's, it's about voodoo either. But it's such a poor country that, as I understand it, the um, eating stray animals is not uncommon. Yeah, yeah. So it's like I say. I don't know. But, Every time I hear him say that, though, I just yeah, it, I, it, it, it gets me. <laughs> it it sounds so ridiculous, and that's how they're playing it. It, it sounds so ridiculous, but uh, I I kind of think that that's going to that he's going to be um, more. He's going to be more vindicated. 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 That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. yeah. Than they think he's going to be. He might be more vindictive too. It's he, hard well, to he's say. definitely probably that, but, <laughs> um, um, yeah, but yeah, he, I think he will end up vindicated though. Yeah. yeah. It's, so. it's looking that way, uh, which is terrible, but it could play really strongly to him. Yeah. Um, on the whole, I think that she came off better. Um, she sounded more prepared, uh, <laughs> even though she didn't really say anything, well, that's been the play since she became candidate. That's, yeah, so it's not new. Yeah. Um, it was only really apparent that Trump didn't have a plan. It wasn't apparent that Kamala didn't have a plan. Yeah. Um, even though it could have been made, uh, <laughs> yeah. apparent pretty easily. Trump didn't handle it very, handle himself very well. He didn't handle her very well. Well, and he definitely let her bait him into a lot of, just yeah. wasting this time talking about nothing. Mm -hmm. And and that was intentional on her part. Don't think yeah. that she didn't know exactly what she was doing. And I just, I, every time crowd she would, sizes, who won the election. Yeah, so, yeah. Like every time she would do it and he would fall for him. Like, man, like this, this truly is a guy that can't look past stuff like that. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, and it does make him in a way kind of easy to control. Mm -hmm. Like somebody that, you know, you can bait into something like that is somebody you have a level of control over. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but he was at the same time able to repeatedly make comments about the state of the economy yeah. uh, and the problems of immigration that may be more lasting than yeah. what she had to say. Yeah, because, I, well, at the end of the day, I think that was just a Trump campaign looking at the polls and being like, look, you need to hammer these two yeah, issues. These home. are the things. Beat her over the head with it. And yeah. he did that. Like, I mean, there's he over and over again, he brought it back to that, mm -hmm. um, which is smart. Although for me, at least, it kind of came off as repetitive. <laughs> like I'm kind of tired of hearing the same two talking points. Yeah, but that it's effective. But it is. You're not wrong. Mm -hmm. So especially when you consider like he wasn't really talking to me. And you that's something that you've got to remember is that you've kind of mentioned here, though, is like they're not talking to the educated voter. They're talking to the person that pays attention every four years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> doesn't just consume politics and policy <laughs> stuff constantly. Exactly. Uh, so. Well, and on that note, like going back to the Ukraine thing, uh, the idea that, you know, that we're not strong enough and, and her comment specifically that, you know, Trump may bring it into the war, but he'll do it by just giving up. Yeah. And, and then of course she, you know, yeah, the, she, the claim she, about uh, he'll be sitting at Kiev looking at Germany or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so ridiculous. I but, thought that was rich. <laughs> but uh, again, if you're not paying attention, if you don't know what the history is here, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people you've heard that, that said over and over and over again on mainstream media, yep. and you believe that mainstream media is uh, a you know some kind of journalistic group. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and uh, and you believe that that's true that um, that he said that he wants to rebuild the Russian uh, the Soviet Empire or whatever which is all a lie. Yeah, yeah. He's there's, never there's, said such a thing. <laughs> there's no evidence to support that. Mm -hmm. And Putin's no idiot anyway. And I don't understand how you can simultaneously hold both of these views in your mind at the same time. That uh, NATO support with weaponry has um, allowed Ukraine to practically defeat Russia in Ukraine. But if we stop giving them weapons, then he'll take over NATO. Yeah. <laughs> if, if just NATO giving weapons to one small country is enough to stop Russia, then what makes you think that if he takes that country, <gasps> that NATO is next? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense at all. Like these two things are mutually exclusive. Yeah. Like both of these things cannot be true at the same time. Exactly. Um, 
But apparently, a lot of people hold both of these beliefs at the same time. I don't know how you do it. Yeah. And um, the, you know, the fact is that Russia's going to win. Like, yeah. there's no stopping it. And why you would risk a general nuclear war yeah. for Ukraine is completely beyond my understanding. And, you know, there, she said something about... Uh, that uh, all the money that we were spending on Afghanistan, like now we're not spending that money anymore because of the Biden administration. I was like, yeah, but now we're spending it in Ukraine and Israel and more than we were spending on Afghanistan. And I'll tell you, I, you know, I'm a bit of a conspiracy theorist, but I think that's the reason why we're spending it in Ukraine. That's probably is because true. once that money and once that Afghan money dried up, it's got to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, that's just yeah, the otherwise way you system... don't get those campaign contributions from those big military contracts. Exactly. And you know, there's an election coming up. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm just because there's always an because election th- because up. there's always an election coming up. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, well, I certainly think that that's part of it. I, uh, I think it has a lot more to do with, well, okay. So, the, we we talked very briefly about the Cheney endorsement oh, on the yes. last podcast. It, yeah. it came it up on your news feed like, news. while we were yeah. recording or something. Yep. Um, and uh, I said, well, I don't think that that it's, you know, that's going to matter to anybody. Like everybody, nobody likes this Nobody's guy. Nobody's looking for the Cheney endorsement, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I have been fascinated by what has happened <laughs> yeah. with that since then. Uh, the Cheney endorsement has been heartily embraced by the um, Harris campaign. Yep. And um, I did. I, it's because they think that, oh, we've got, because I think she even talked about it in the debate about. Like, we've got 200, 200 Republicans. That, exactly. Mm-hmm. And what what is lost in this is that, that yes, you have the establishment wing of the Republican Party would prefer Harris over Trump. Yeah. I asked... A, That's just um, what it is. I, I asked a left winger that I know, I was like, how do you feel about being, um, uh, you know, being part of the party that is the, the party of uh, Dick Cheney and, oh gosh, who was the other... Um, person that i use is another like terrible republican yeah yeah, uh neocon Uh, bill crystal i was like how do you feel about being the uh the party endorsed by uh, bill crystal and dick cheney right (laughs) you feel good about that now is that that where you want to be like and what they told me was uh well they just don't like donald trump yeah and that's and i argued i said no it's because um they want the imperial United States Mm -hmm. and they're more likely to get that out of the Harris presidency than the Trump presidency who has, you know, if nothing else, at least shown skepticism about the military, um, adventurism and the Harris presidency. I mean, Biden certainly hasn't and the Harris presidency. I don't think will either. Um, so they, I said, I think that these neocons see that they have the allies, in the Democrat party, not in the Republican party now. Yep. Um, and they were like, no, no, no. It's just that they don't like Trump because Trump is so bad and blah, blah, blah. Well, it, and they, they care about democracy. And I was like, Dick Cheney has never, <laughs> never cared about, cared democracy. about democracy. That's, That's the, the last most ridiculous he, argument. He cares so about. Yeah. I'm going to play another clip here, um, which is Liz Cheney explaining why she endorsed, she and her father endorsed the Harris campaign. All so right. let's hear it from them. All right. We've been talking about economic policy. Um, you know, you look at national security policy. And again, there are certainly areas where I disagree with Biden administration national security policy, where I've disagreed with Vice President Harris's position on issues. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to fundamental alliances, when it comes to the importance of NATO, for example, uh, and, and how important it is for the United States to lead in the world, we've seen a, a, a sea change. We now have a Republican Party that is embracing isolationism, that is embracing Putin, uh, that, you know, we've seen just in the last week, the Republican vice presidential nominee willing to appear, willing to be interviewed by Tucker Carlson, who is platforming pro-Nazis, is himself pushing pro-Nazi propaganda. That is not the party of Ronald Reagan. Yeah, Ronald Reagan 
negotiated with the Russians. Yeah. So that's exactly what I was going to say. It's really rich to hear her say that that uh, the republic, the yeah, that the Trump Republicans are the ones that don't that are embracing isolationism mm-hmm. seriously from the from the group that won't talk to anybody. Yeah. As far as our 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 enemies are concerned, it's ridiculous. It, yeah. it it's it's really kind of infuriating. Yeah. The, the part in there that really stood out to me is the, um, the idea that, uh, the United States needs to lead in the world. Um, and that attitude is what has led to a lot of the antagonism with other major powers. Absolutely. It is. Um, and so, but anyway, yeah, right from her own mouth. Why do we support the Harris campaign? Because their foreign policy is our, uh, imperialistic foreign policy that we've always believed in. Yep. I mean, that's, that's what it is. That we want the U S to be the, the sole hegemonic power in the world Yeah. that no other country can have any kind of sphere of influence. It's only the United States. That's what they want. They see that as a greater possibility with the Harris campaign than they do with the Trump campaign. And that's why a whole bunch of these neocons are going back this is an important point too. Yep. back to the Democrat party because they started in the Democrat party and yeah. then they went to the Republican party when they saw their, um, their foreign policy being espoused more on the Republican side. And yeah. now they're seeing it more on the Democrat side. So they're going back to the Democrat party. Yeah. Uh, you're 100% right. Like it's, it's, but the, I mean, just like you're saying they they, they just grift to wh- whichever one is going to go their way. And here's the real problem with them is that they don't want peace, they want victory. Yeah. And there's a big difference there. We could have peace in Ukraine, and people would mm-hmm. stop dying, but they don't want peace in Ukraine. They yeah. want victory over Russia. Yeah. And they're not going to get it either, which well, is the And that's worst the, part. the astonishing thing is that, like, like we're not going to get rid of Putin. Like, if Putin mm-hmm. leaves, it's not going to be because of us. And we certainly should hope that it's not because of us. Because if we remove Putin from Russia, like, whatever follows Putin after that will be so much more worse for us than, than Putin could ever be. Yeah, Bill Burns, who was former ambassador to Russia, who wrote the Niet Means Niet yeah. um, memo, yeah. um, who is now the director of the CIA. Yeah recently appeared and he's had a few just crazy things to say. Yeah. Um, one of them was that, um, uh, he said that this, uh, invasion into Kursk by Ukraine, um, has shown weakness of, uh, Vladimir Putin and that there are some elites in Russia that are, are, um, dissatisfied with Putin because of this. Yeah. It's like, Yeah. But they're dissatisfied because they don't think that he's doing enough to crush Ukraine. Exactly. They, Are they, those the people want, that you want to replace Putin? You want to get that, rid of Putin and get somebody more radical, more? Yeah, because that's what you get, especially if we start putting our finger on the scale, mm-hmm. which is, ex- I mean, we're already putting our finger oh, on yeah. the scale. So, I mean, let's not even pretend like that's not going on. Yeah, he, he also said um, that we don't need to worry about nuclear war. Oh, yeah. 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 We don't need to worry about nuclear war. Because if it happens, we'll all be gone anyway. Well, (laughs) that's probably the proper way to look at it. But I think what he means is, well, because it hasn't happened, it can't. Yeah. Uh, Uh, Which is ridiculous. And I think this is maybe what's missing from American foreign policy. We need to fear nuclear war. Yeah. Because we had a much more restrained, sane uh, foreign policy when we were afraid of nuclear war. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Um, the, uh, so David Sanger, who's a well-known uh, journalistic liar, so yeah. you know, take this with a grain of salt, but he, he does release the information that the intelligence community wants him to. Yeah. Um, had an article in the New York Times where he was saying, uh, well, I say he's a liar. He could just be a fool. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's a possibility. I, yeah. I you never know what these guys are. <laughs> yeah. Right? I think he's a liar, but maybe he's just a fool, yeah. um, to be fair. Uh, but he had an article that said that North Korea and China are rapidly increasing their nuclear production, like yeah. much faster than we anticipated. Really? Or that our intelligence anticipated. Yeah. Um, now, China has maintained about three or 400 uh, nuclear weapons for a long time. 
Yeah. Um, and apparently they're, they're asking questions about, or looking into the history of the cold war and how the U S and the Soviet union calculated just how much of the country, the opposing country, um, they needed to destroy to maintain an effective deterrent. Yeah. And so, you know, we've, I've always said on this podcast, like, well, they have 300 or 400 nuclear weapons. Even if you could destroy 99% of them, which three or four American cities are you willing to give up? Yeah, um, exactly. Just to win this. Yeah. And, uh, I guess the, what they're, they've decided is that, yeah, Michael's right. Yeah. It's not enough to keep them from attacking us. Yeah. So we need to make sure that we can utterly destroy the continent almost no matter what. Yeah. And how many is that? And they're trying to get there. Yeah. And I don't, you know, don't know what the grand goal is. Maybe they want to get to nuclear parity with, with Russia and the United States. That would be about 1500, I think <sighs> nuclear weapons. That's so many. Like I just, it's enough to that no matter how much damage you do to the opposing strike force, yeah, you'll lose your entire nation. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's what they're looking at is the only effective deterrent, I guess, at this point, yeah. um, because we keep antagonizing them, even though we know that they're a nuclear power. And yeah. it obviously hasn't stopped us from being involved in a proxy war with Russia, yeah. even though they're a much larger nuclear power. Yeah. So we're... <sighs> We're forcing this response by our own actions, by not being reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, um, and of course, North Korea, they, there was a nuclear deal with North Korea a long time ago, um, similar to the um, JCPOA uh, nuclear deal with Iran, yeah. which is also dead. Yeah. Um, but... Before North Korea actually started producing nuclear weapons, and this is kind of a warning about Iran, by the way, um, we North Korea was named as part of the Axis of Evil. Yep. Uh, they the United States tore up the agreed upon framework, which was their nuclear deal, the nuclear deal that we had with them, um, and named North Korea as a potential first strike target in the nuclear posture review. And all of those things happened before Kim Jong-il at the time decided, you know what, we're going to tear up the framework too since nobody's participating in it but us and we're going to start producing nu nuclear weapons. Yeah. So. I mean, like, <laughs> if we hadn't told them that we were going to nuke them, maybe they wouldn't have started mm -hmm. building nuclear weapons. I don't know. It's just, it's incredible to me. It goes back to that idea, though, that it's be we don't want peace, we want victory. Yeah. Yeah. You're not wrong. And this is a, this is a dangerous foreign policy approach for yeah. all of us. For everybody. In an, in the nuclear age. Yeah. So, um, I'm just frustrated with, <laughs> with all of that. Yeah. It's, it's hard as libertarians and sitting here having the correct answers and knowing, knowing what needs to happen and just watching it not get implemented mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Yeah. So um, Iran had given up their um, pursuit of weapons, and they'd never actually pursued weapons. They'd just done some research into what it would require. Take, yeah. Um, and then uh, there was the the statement against the use of weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. But here we are. We had a good nuclear agreement. They were being watched closer than anybody in the world. And they weren't producing anywhere close to nuclear weapons. They were staying within the framework. Donald Trump tore up the deal. Yep. The only person to drop out, only country to drop out. There's a bunch of yeah. uh, European countries that remained involved. Yep. Um, and uh, Iran actually was well within their agreement to start increasing um, enrichment. Yeah. When the sanctions were put on them. Yeah. And of course, they've maintained them. The, like the Biden administration has maintained those sanctions. Uh, you have the same kind of issue in China. In fact, they talked about it that in the debate too. Um, that uh, Trump had put all the um, tariffs, tariffs yeah. on China, and that Biden had maintained them. Yeah. Uh, none of this is productive for us. Mm -mm. No, contrary to Trump's claims that, that they were just bringing in so much money from China, they couldn't walk away from it. Yeah. Um, 
like uh, that's not the reason for the inflation we're facing now, but it doesn't help. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this though, at, at the same time, um, it, an America first policy, if there's been a little bit of talk bandied about, um, from the Trump side of getting rid of the income tax yeah. and replacing it with higher tariffs. Yeah. That, that will have an impact, a positive one, I would think. Yeah. Um, in terms of just production within the U S yeah, it would have, uh, a, a, man, can you imagine not having the income tax? Yeah. And it's a more effective uh, way of taxing wealth. Yeah. Also, um, it's essentially a tax on goods. It would, be, it would turn into something like a sales tax. I mean, yeah. um, and in fact, I think sales tax was part of that as well, but taxing consumption is a more effective way of taxing wealth than income. Yeah. Well, and I, I like it just because the pure, like you have to take some kind of action. Like mm-hmm. I, I hate the idea of I made money, so now I have to pay a tax. Like I didn't do anything with that money. All I did was earn it. Yeah. And I have to pay taxes on it. Like that's just, that whole concept has always been wild to me. And mm-hmm. I think it would be wild to everybody if we hadn't have grown up with it all of our lives and yeah. always known it's there. Yeah. Like if you just like, I don't know, it just, it's, it, it boggles my mind that we accept that. Yeah. We've only had a steady income tax in this country for just over a hundred years. Yeah. Well, like for, not a whole lot of people around that don't that were yeah. <laughs> around before of, that. Yeah. yeah, half of the nation's history there was no income tax, more yeah. than half. Oh yeah. Um. So, you know, just bear that in mind. Of course, now we have the largest government in the history of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And of course, if they're not taxing it, they're printing it, which works the same way. Works the same way. Exactly. <laughs> yep. It's just less obvious. Yep. Um. But uh, I, I think that our, our foreign policy has gone completely mad, and I think that we need to focus on peace again and not yeah. dominance. It, it would be nice to have a candidate that made that the centerpiece of their campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, one more thing I will say about the debate that I thought about kind of afterwards is it really felt like in 2016 Trump had a lot to say. Yeah. And walking away from that debate, I didn't feel that way. Well, <laughs> or, I, I think... I think he's saying the same things. The difference is that he's talking about how great he's going to make things when he hasn't had the chance. It has more of an impact than when he has, and he didn't make that and much it, of an impact. Yeah, you're right about that. Um, so, it's, uh, you know, now if you're just like, well, you know, these things aren't working and I'm going to go in there and fix them. Well, the same question he kept trying to ask Harris, which is, well, why didn't you do it while you were there? Yeah, you've had the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> and we've seen the type of people you put around you. John Bolton. Bolton. God, man. That guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's, I I maintain that he's really good at firing people because he's really terrible at hiring people. Yeah, there's definitely something to that. Mm-hmm. Um, There was another issue you wanted to bring up. Yeah, yeah and I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but I, I did think it was worth talking about. Um. I don't know if everybody, how much attention everybody pays to this kind of thing, but um, Tariq Hill was um, stopped outside of the his stadium in Miami on the way to the game Sunday. Who's Tariq Hill? So he is the wide receiver for Miami. Okay. Um, Dolphins? Dolphins, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, he was stopped and... Um, I mean, I, the videos out there, they, they released the body camera footage the same day and, and I watched it and it was, you know... He was kind of a jerk, Tariq was. Like, mm-hmm. so they what ended up happening is the cop came up and tapped on his window, and Tariq rolled the window down and, like, talked to him for just a minute and was kind of agitated with the cop. And so he rolled the window back up. And then so the cop started beating on it again. And one thing kind of led to another, and they ended up pulling Tariq out of the vehicle, like, slamming him on the ground, and it became a whole big scene. Um, and what... <sighs> You know, you say what you will about it. I think that both the officer and Tariq were both in the wrong. The truth is, is if Tariq had just done what the officer asked, it wouldn't have came to all of that. Mm -hmm. And Tariq said in his defense that he didn't want to leave the window down because he was afraid of drawing a crowd, which he got when he got pulled out of the car. They ended up detaining multiple other players. And um, Tariq only got a ticket, I think, for the speeding and I think failure to comply or something, but they ended up mm-hmm. citing multiple players for um, like, like I think the same type thing, like failure to comply and they detained a bunch of them. It was a whole big thing. Um, 
and honestly, that's not even really what I want to talk about though. Okay. With it. What struck me when I watched the video. I, actually, before you go into that, I, I will say people who are in the public eye should already know this. Yeah. Um, but you can, he could have explained to the cop like, Hey, look, I'm well, I'm a famous professional football player. Can we? Can you follow me to some other location? I'm glad you mentioned that because actually that's something. So Tariq's defense of not wanting to leave the window down was that he didn't want to draw a crowd and he didn't mm-hmm. want people videoing and that kind of thing. But he never mentions that yeah. throughout the conversation. Like I mean, he's he's being a jerk to the cop. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, he is. Like there's no two ways about that. Like that's what's happening. Um, so, but which, uh, by the way. Like, that's part of the job if you're a cop. Like, yeah. I'm sorry, it sucks. All these back the blue people, they're all like, oh, you know, you gotta, if he had just done what they said, it wouldn't have been, none of this would have happened. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But guess what? The public don't work that way. I work with the public every day. The public is jerks. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just, they, these officers should be trained to de escalate situations mm-hmm. just like this. Well, if he rolled up his window and wouldn't communicate, like, well, he cracked it and was talking to the guy through it. Uh, um, now, he wasn't telling him why he wouldn't roll it down, and he was being a jerk. Like, he was being a jerk. Like, yeah. I, make no mistake about it. Like, um, and even Tariq said uh, after the vi- what body cam video was released, he wasn't saying this before, by the way, <laughs> but he did say that he was like, I could have been better through that incident. And he yeah. absolutely could have. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, like I say, you'll get no argument from me there. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, these officers should be trained to de-escalate situations and not escalate them. Mm-hmm. And this cop did escalate it. Like, there was no reason to pull him out of that vehicle. Mm-hmm. Like, as much of a jerk as he was being, he wasn't a threat to anybody. Like, I mean, that's just what it is. Well, I mean, what's what's the alternative if he won't engage, though? Well, I mean, he was talking to the guy through the crack in the window. Um, and he had already rolled the window down. The cop got to see inside the vehicle. It's not mm-hmm. like that he had, like, cracked the window and that was the only thing he had done he had rolled it down and they kind of went back and forth and then he rolled it back up and cracked it and that's kind of and the officer just kept demanding you're going to roll this window down or i'm going to pull you out of the car Mm. in fact and actually what he said was exactly that and then he was like in fact you're you need to get out of the car and then Tariq didn't immediately jump out of the car so we opened the door and slammed him on the ground and the whole thing happened um, but the thing I wanted to kind of talk about and this is silly i'm just going to tell you like i watched the video and after saying every all of that, like this was the thing that really struck me was the language being used by the officers during the whole altercation, mm-hmm. the foul language being yeah, used by the officers. That bothers me too. So I'm not alone here then, because no. I really thought I might be on an island on this one. No, but, no, no. I, if they're they're public servants, they're supposed to be professional and represent the the government. They should um, not use. Uh, a lot of foul language. Yeah, especially towards citizens. Mm -hmm. And like I say, Tariq, say what you will, he was a jerk, but people are a jerk to me all the time. I work work in the public. Mm -hmm. Um, People are a jerk to me all the time. Guess what? If I start using a bunch of foul language towards customers, guess what I'm not going to have? A job. (laughs) It's just what it is. Like uh, my company and most companies do not tolerate that. Yeah. And the I, fact actually, that, I think that we've brought, I mean, we may not have brought it up on this podcast. I'm kind of surprised if we haven't, but that's one of the things that has uh, bothered me for a long time about these various uh, interactions with law enforcement is the the level of profanity used. Yeah. Yeah. And I understand that when somebody starts cursing you, it's hard not to curse back. I get it. <laughs> Dude, but, believe me, I get it because yeah. I, that's something I deal with on a fairly regular, not uh, enough that it's a problem. Like, yeah. I mean, I that, don't anymore, but I used to work at a call center so yeah you just you can't you can't <laughs> respond back in that manner mm-hmm. and even if you're throwing somebody on the ground which like i say they, i don't think he had the right to throw him on the ground but he certainly didn't have a right to throw him on the ground and talk to him the way he was yeah i felt like um so i don't know and i'll do something i just want to kind of mention in this respect is if we started demanding it just a little better from our officers like mm-hmm. i mean that's and i think that that's while it's a small thing I think it would have a big impact. Yeah, because the other side of that is that when somebody starts cursing you, you bristle. Yeah, yeah. Like if somebody starts cursing me, I know that I I am more ready to fight after that cursing starts than before. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, and because it goes back to what I said in the beginning, Mm -hmm. de-escalation. That should always be the goal here. Yeah, the officers, I I understand (laughs) like they're the the person and authority there and that they should represent that. Yeah. But 
Um, at the same time, you are supposed to be a public servant and you should be respectful, even if yeah. the person doesn't deserve it. Yeah, 100%. Like, and, I, and, that, and I've seen them do that too, which is, well, but a whole lot less of that. <laughs> there's not a lot of it, but, and, and I have seen Well, those it. things don't make, they don't make viral videos. videos well, yeah, that, what but, I was going to say is, like I know in our community groups here in Baldwin County, the mm -hmm. um, different ones, like the past couple of weeks, there's been a lot of posts about just, just calling out officers doing something good. Mm -hmm. And I'm all for that. Like I, yeah. I, I think that is awesome. Um, and I like, that's what, but that's what, that should be what we're striving for. Mm -hmm. Like that should, that should be what all of these officers are, are wanting to represent and be. And, and it's tough because as somebody that's managed people for 20 years now, it's hard to put somebody in a position of authority and them not want to overuse that authority. Um, yeah. I see it in management all the time where you, you put, you give somebody just this little taste of power and it goes to their head. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that, but that's something that we as citizens should recognize and ask for better from our, from our policing. Yeah. And it should come top down from the the policing organizations as well, like the sheriff's office or the, you know, whatever, the county, yeah. the city levels. They're the supervisors and um, and uh, higher level officers there, higher ranked officers there should be demanding that as well. Absolutely. Like, watch yeah. your mouth, be yeah. respectful, yeah. We're not be gonna... firm, but... Yeah. You don't need to talk to these people like they're scum. Yeah, absolutely. Even when they are. Even when they are. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's just something to think about, especially for the people that are the big back to blue. Like I say, I don't, I don't hate cops, but this is the kind of thing that bothers me, though. Yeah, like this is this is and this is the reason that so many people really do hate cops mm -hmm. is because of just what we're talking about right here. Yeah. So just something to munch on. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, I was going to go try and pull a quote, but I don't, I know I can't leave you with the mic alone. So, uh, <laughs> I'll recommend I'm going to, I'm going to stay the part that I always think is the most important part. Um, the, the quotes about patriotism and nationalism. Yeah. Uh, but, um, it ends with, um, uh, greatness is not required of a country. Only goodness is. And um, I just wanted to bring that to light with all this talk about, you know, wanting victory instead of peace. Yeah. Peace is greater than victory. Yeah. It should always be. Mm -hmm. Like that should be because just like in the Ukraine thing, like Ukraine's not winning this. Yeah. So well, the, I mean, so this is the same idea... problem that Israel's having too. Yeah. Um, Israel doesn't want peace. They want victory. Yeah. And, um, and at the end of the day, you can't beat an idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's the problem that Israel has is, mm -hmm. is they can't stomp out an idea. It's just, especially an idea yeah. like not wanting to be dominated by the other side. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and there's a, that reminds me of another quote. It's an old Lakota Sioux proverb. It says, um, uh, force, no matter how concealed, begets resistance. Yep. Now that's, that's mm. it checks out. And that, yeah, and that kind of goes along with your, policing thing there too yeah uh all right well let's go ahead and wrap up there then um yeah uh so we will be back next week yeah thursday or friday not shaking your head no so yeah. um i'm not gonna think i'm pretty that. sure it's gonna be friday i'm it may not work out but i'm trying to make plans for thursday night so uh i like that there's football on thursday yeah, i would I rather thought, do friday i thought that you'd <laughs> probably be okay with that yep um so, yeah, but we'll be back next week. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Uh, like and share, comment, subscribe, um, leave reviews. You can always contact me with suggestions, uh, argument, <laughs> yeah. um, other information um, at michael at thelibertymike.com. Uh, I think that's all the things. So yeah. Um, but we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm -hmm.